I decide to make it 120, then my opponent is in the tank. Hey YouTube. G'day poker people, welcome back to the vlog. It's currently about midday and I've been invited back to yet another Melbourne home game. I've never been to this one before, it starts in about an hour, so I thought it'd be a super interesting vlog. Maybe the dynamics of the hands will be different. It'll be cool to check out whatever the case. So without any further ado, let's get in the game. Welcome back everyone. We're about 48 hours removed from the home game I went to. Ended up playing seven hours. It was a 1-3 game, brought in for 300. Now let's go over the hand histories and see if I could run it up. Let's go. First hand up, there's three field limpers. Then the action's on an unknown cutoff who raises it up to six. The button calls to six. Then the action's on my small blind with ace, queen of spades. Definitely going to go ahead and three bet here. I'll probably raise a wider three bet range here with the smaller sizing. I just don't think they're ever raising that size with a really strong hand. But when we have ace, queen suited, we'd be three betting anyway. So I go ahead and make it 30, and then I get a call from the Lojack, who was one of the original limpers, and the button calls as well, the original raiser folded. So we go three ways to a flop of ace, queen, seven with two clubs. The actions on me here, and it's pretty interesting whether I want to see bet or not. Definitely could try and get some value with a hand this strong, but in game, I actually decided to check here. I just think since we have the board so locked up this hard, we're better off checking it into two potential opponents who can bet off with worse hands. So I check it, then the low jack checks, and the button goes ahead and bets 56 when the action's on me here. Another interesting decision, whether we want to check raise or just call, I decide to just call. The opponent only had about 200 in their stack. It's going to be very easy to get all in with them on pretty much any turn. And we just want to keep some bluffs in their range if they are bluffing or semi-bluffing, something like that, rather than potentially raise them off of all of their bluffs now. So I throw in the call, the low jack folds, and then we're heads up to a turn, which is the five of spades. I go ahead and check it, mixing in my plan to try and get the opponent for their full stack. The action's on them, and they go ahead and bet 76. Pretty no-brainer decision at this point to rip it all in, really hoping my opponent calls off with like an ace jack or ace 10, maybe even a combo draw, flush draw type thing. So I rip it all in for 150. The opponent hits the tank somehow, so we know they have gotta be pretty weak, probably on a draw. And then they're like, you know what, forget it. I call, now I go ahead and show them my ace queen suited, and then the opponent asks if we can run it twice, and I'm more than happy to oblige. We've got the live right now, the opponent didn't end up showing their hand, but they're calling for a six, so pretty likely they have pocket sixes or nine eight. And we've got the live run out on the vlog for y'all, so let's see what happens. The first river, it's three spades, it's good for us, it's not a six. The second river's another three, and then the opponent ends up mucking their hand, we don't ever see what they have. But we scoop in this first hot and running hot to start the things off. This next hand is actually a 1-3-6. And I know because I'm the 6, I decided to put the straddle on. Not many other people at the table were straddling and I was sort of trying to normalise it a bit. Didn't work out for me as the session goes on. Pretty much played as a 1-3 for the entire thing. But at least for this one hand, it was 1-3-6. There are three limpers. Then the action's on my straddle with 8-3 of clubs. Pretty no-brainer decision to go ahead and check this hand and take a free flop. And I'm glad we did because the flop is 8-8-5 with two hearts. Big blind checks it over to me. And now I definitely want to go ahead and bet my troops for value. Get called by flush draws. And even hands like 5x that'll call now but won't call on certain scare cards. We want to get as much value from them as we can. Do want to use a smaller sizing though, just having locks the board up so much yet again. So I go ahead and bet 15. So I get a call from under the gun and then the big blind calls as well. So we're still three ways to a turn, which is the four of clubs, which isn't the best turn card in the world. Six, seven makes a straight now. And I really do think either of the opponents could have a six, seven offsuit. When the big blind checks it to me again, I kind of still want to go for value. I really do think that we can still get called by flush draws with overcards and maybe a hand like ace five or five six or get a bit stubborn, particularly 5-6, which now has a gut shot as well. And we're really not going to get any more value from those hands on the river. I just want to go ahead and bet them while we still can get called. Definitely am concerned if we do get any resistance from this point forward with our, the kicker to our eight being so low. I go ahead and bet 50. The under the gun player folds and then the big blind throws in the call. So we're heads up to a river, which is the tennis spades. And this is where things get interesting because the big blind decides to lead out for 100. 
Now, the action's on me here, and I already put this hand up on Instagram, and if you follow my Instagram, you already know what I do in this spot, but I actually think this is a really gross spot. I don't think my opponent is value betting a worse hand. I think they definitely do have a bunch of stronger trips in their range, as well as the offsuit 7-6 combinations, all of which I lose to, which I definitely could see them taking this line with. If they're bluffing, it would have to be with something like a missed heart draw. I do think there's a lot of merit to folding. When I put it up on Instagram, I think 96% of people said that they were cool in this spot, which I definitely do understand. It is possible that my opponent is bluffing with a worse flush draw. Some people said that they might be betting with a 10, which I'm like pretty skeptical of, and I don't think they have that many 10s either, maybe like ace 10 hearts, but I really don't think they're gonna take this sizing when I've shown so much strength over the past two streets, betting into multiple people twice. I think it's pretty face up that I have an eight, and I really feel like my opponent is betting out for value, either with an eight that's gonna have us out kicked, or with a straight, maybe even a full house. So that was my logic on this hand, and it lands me on the decision to go ahead and fold my trips. This decision wasn't very popular when I put it up on Instagram, and in retrospect, against an unknown opponent, like I've only been playing with this guy about 10 minutes now, I don't really know that much about them, and I shouldn't just assume that people always play really tight in live poker, because some people do mix it up with bluff sometimes, and we're never gonna know if this opponent was bluffing or not, but maybe I shouldn't be so cautious initially when I don't know anything about an opponent. Next hand, the plus one player raises it up to 12, and then the small blind who have played in the previous two hands throws in the call. Now I look down at ace king offsuit in the big blind, definitely gonna go ahead and three bet here. I decide to make it 55 and then the plus one folds and the small blind calls. So it heads up with the small blind again. Flop is a six three with two clubs. When the small blind checks to me, definitely wanna go ahead and bet my top pair for value. Gonna to have to size down though on an ace high board in a three bet pot. I bet 35, then my opponent doesn't think long at all before throwing in the call. So it heads up to the turn, which is the jack of diamonds. The opponent checks it over to me again. I think this is a good spot to keep betting for value. There is a very decent chance my opponent has a worse ace X hand or a flush draw, and we can get value from all those hands with the nut ace. But the turn card can be a bit of a scam. My opponent definitely is gonna have all the offsuit ace jack combinations and we are going to bet a polarized range on this board and we are going to want to protect our check back range with some strong hands since we're going to be checking here a lot with like our jack x hands and pocket queens if we are going to check that more mediocre holdings we do want to protect it with some stronger holdings and i could potentially see using ace king as a check for that reason but but i went ahead and decided to bet it just expecting the opponent to call with all of their ace x and flush draws and I really just think I'm gonna be losing EV by not putting in the value bet. So I decide to go ahead and make it 90. And then the opponent takes a bit longer this time before deciding to throw in the call again. So we're heads up to the river, which is the two of clubs. Definitely not the best river in the world. The front door flush gets in. So when the opponent checks it over to me, with an SPR that's slightly over a third the size of the pot, there definitely is merit to going all in with Ace King just to really try and get called by an ace x hand. I do think if we were at a deeper SPR, like I had to go all in for an SPR of one, then my opponent would be very inclined to hero fold hands like ace queen. But getting such a good price, I think they might call off with their ace x hands. So probably is a good spot to just try and maximize value by ripping it all in. In game, I think I got a bit scared by the rivered flush and I just end up showing my hand and then my opponent does muck. Wonder if I did miss a bit of value by not going all in on the river. Next hand up, the under the gun raises it up to 30. No, this isn't a straddle pot. It's still just a 1-3, and she went ahead and 10 x opened it. Then the small blind, who have been mixing it up with the past few hands, throws in the call. And then I'm in the big blind with ace-queen offsuit, and this is a pretty interesting spot. Whenever someone opens to a size that's 6x or larger, I usually take a 3-bet or fold strategy against the opens just because I think you're going to make more EV by either value punishing them with what is likely a strong range of hands on their part 
or getting them to fold preflop after they've invested so much money. So with a hand like Ace Queen that is like a very strong hand, but looks a bit less attractive against the 10x open, it really is a close spot whether you want to three bet or not. The only thing that tilts me to go ahead and three bet in this spot is that the opponent did open pocket queens last hand and she only used a 5x open that hand. So I wonder if it's like a thing where she sized up from 5x because she's playing a more vulnerable hand like jacks, tens, ace, jack, something like that. And then I can probably just get some folds and very happy to take down 60 preflop. Could be the opposite of that though, where she is doing this because she has kings or aces and she's much more confident than she was with pocket queens. Could see going either way with the ace queen, whether it's a three bet or a fold. Do not like calling though. I was tilted by the fact that she raised smaller with queens. So I did three bet to 130. Then the action's back on her. She thinks a bit for announcing all in. Then the small blind gets out of the way. The action's back on me. And, and I think we're probably gonna have to just fold in this spot. My opponent could have a more vulnerable hand like pocket jacks or ace jack. But when I asked for a counter less stack, she was just sort of like, oh yeah, you know, it's whatever. She seemed like very calm and not chalant. I mean, the hand's probably a fold anyway, in all honesty. I go ahead and fold the ace queen there. Then the opponent was actually kind enough to show us pocket kings after the hand was over. So very, very glad that we did get out of the way. Next hand, the low jack opens it up to 12. Then I'm in the cutoff with ace queen of clubs. I three bet it to 35. Then the actions round to a vlog watcher on the big blind. Shout outs to you dude, you threw in the call on the big blind and then the low jack folded. So it heads up with a vlog watcher to a flop of five, four, three, all hearts. The opponent checks it over to me and usually in on a monotone board and specifically on a monotone board in a three bet pot, I would go ahead and use a range bet of a smaller sizing just because a lot of the hands in my opponent's range that do not have a heart are gonna be very, very hard press to call off on a flop like this. I think when they call call a three bet pre-flop, it's gonna be a lot of like ace king, ace queen, pocket sevens through pocket queens. And you know, all those pocket pairs, if they don't have a heart, it's gonna be hard for them to call off multiple barrels. So I think the best play here is to definitely go ahead and bet, probably bet something around the size of 25. That's not what I did in game though. I actually went ahead, went ahead and bet 60. This is a very large sizing. I think my thinking at the time was, I really want to get those folds from like pocket jacks without a heart and using a large sizing will get them off of it right now. Definitely like a bit of tilt going on here. Not even sure why I was tilted at this point. I had a bit of win every pot syndrome and I used way too large of a C-bet sizing on this board and this is a pretty egregious mistake in all honesty. Then the opponent tanks a bit before deciding to throw in the call. The turn is the five of spades. The opponent checks it over to me and pretty interesting decision whether we want to keep bluffing or not. The reasons I would like continuing to bluff are going to be able to put pressure on my opponents. Over pairs to the board, I think specifically the ones without a heart definitely will fold now. But if they do have a heart, they're definitely going to call. And if they do start to call with ones without a heart, then I'm definitely giving away a lot of EV to my opponent by continuing to bluff. I really think this hand just goes back to the big mistake I made on the flop by bombing it. I, I'm not really sure what my range looks like here. Like it's probably still not all of the hands I three bet with. It's, it's probably more polarized. And I guess if it's more polarized, this is a fine hand to continue bluffing with. We do block my opponent having pocket queens and pocket aces which is great. So I mean, maybe this is a good candidate for that reason, but it's sort of one of those things when you stuff up an early straight and then it's like you're sort of in no man's land at this point. Either way, I did decide to check. Then we're heads up to a river, which is the seven of hearts. The opponent checks it over to me again. And now I kind of want to bluff just because the river was the fourth heart. I think 100% if my opponent does have, you know, pocket jacks without a heart, pocket tens without a heart, like they're absolutely gonna have to fold. They're gonna know I have a bunch of hands like ace of hearts, king of spades in my range. And it's gonna be really, really hard for them to call off with anything that's not a flush. So for that reason, I like going for the bluff here. I decide to make it 120, which I think is probably the same size I would use if I did have the ace of hearts here. Then my opponent is in the tank for probably like 10 seconds and they sort of stare me down and then they decide to throw in the call. Not the news we were hoping for. We end up showing our ace queen and the opponent shows pocket jacks with a heart. So definitely gonna be hard pressed to get them off of that hand, but really kicking myself for the large C-bet sizing. Pretty egregious error in all honesty. And 
I think I've got to keep a lookout for whatever tilted me on this hand because honestly, I don't recognize it off top. Next hand, under the gun and plus one both limp. And I'm in plus two with my favorite hand in all of poker. I go ahead and raise aces up to 20. And then the small blind, who was the same villain in the previous hand calls, has to do both of the limpers. So we go four ways to a flop of king, jack, eight, rainbow. The action checks to me, and I decide to check back. Definitely merits going ahead and see betting here, but I'm just really concerned that I am behind with three other people in the pot, and I really do want to give the other opponents an opportunity to bet off worse hands. Definitely merits betting here. So could go either way. I just decided to check in game, set a bit of a trap. And then the turn was the two of clubs, small blind checks, and then under the gun decides to bet out for 20. Plus one throws in the call. Now the action's on me here and pretty interesting spot whether we want to go for a bit of a cheeky raise for value or whether we want to just call. I do think the chances that we're good here are pretty likely. I think under the gun's leading range for this size. It's got to have a lot of like one pair hands. Definitely going to have some kings, maybe some 8x, maybe open-ended straight draws that they're trying to set their price to draw on type things. So we could race and get value from those hands. Still feels like a bit of an overplay, but maybe it's not because I feel like the small blind isn't going to have a super strong hand when they check the turn. And I don't think the plus one's going to have a hand stronger than two pair when they just call the 20. So pretty decent chance we are ahead. And I think I'm missing a bit of value by not raising it here. As you can probably tell by how I'm talking, I did decide to just call, and I do think it is a mistake. I think I am losing value with my aces here. He actually gets back to the small blind, and they throw in the call as well. So we are still four ways to a river, which is the two of hearts, so repeat two. Now we actually counterfeit any two pair, not that I thought any of the opponents had two pair anyway. And the action check actually checks to me, this time definitely wanna go ahead and value bet now. I decide to bet 110. Might be a bit big though. I think the only player that realistically has a king is the under the gun opponent and they are a bit more tight aggressive so they might actually be able to make a good lay down with a king with a weak kicker. So maybe this is a bit too big. And then the small blind is in the tank for probably a good 30 seconds or so before sighing and throwing in the call. Both the plus one and under the gun fold. I go ahead and show my aces to the villain and then they go ahead and show me pocket queens. So very happy to get the river bet paid off. Kind of feel a bit tilted that the opponent knew not to three bet me in that spot. That was a really good read by them. Next hand, there's five limps, and then the action's on my big blind. I look down at ace-king suited. I go ahead and raise it up to 35, and then only the small blind, who we've already mixed up with a few times, throws in the call. So we're heads up to a flop of ace-nine-six with two clubs. The opponent checks it over to me. Want to go ahead and use a range bet here. It's kind of like a three bet pot dynamic that I'm going to have a really tight range opening over so many callers, and that tight range is going to have a lot of strong ace-x hands, so go ahead and bet 20 and then my opponent throws in the call. So we're heads up to a turn which is the queen of diamonds putting out backdoor diamonds. The opponent checks it over to me again and definitely want to keep betting for value. There's so many flush draws we can get called by worse ace-x hands so I go ahead and bet 130 and the opponent is in the tank for probably like 10 seconds before deciding to throw in the call. So we're heads up to the river which is the six of hearts and then the opponent just snap goes all in for about 240. The action's on me here and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. The opponent's representing that they have a six and then I look at the board and I'm like okay they actually definitely could have you know six x of clubs. That hand does make a lot of sense and pretty concerned that they hit the river and now they're going for max value worried I'm going to check back back in ace but the thing is if they can have six five of clubs couldn't they have like nine eight of clubs that didn't get there nine eight of diamonds even that didn't get there and they're just using this kind of scare card as a good spot to bluff so i really think the right play is to defend my range particularly when i do have one of the strong hands i'm gonna have i think i got in my own head a bit for this hand and i just got like so easy for them to just have like six three of clubs here and uh, i'm just gonna pay off I really think i got in my own head here and Actually decided to fold, pretty bad fold in all honesty, should be protecting my range in this spot. I didn't want to pay them off if they had a six, but I don't think they have a six often enough at all for this to be a profitable fold for me to make. So really kicking myself for this one. Then the opponent asks if we want to see what they had and I'm like, Absolutely, this is going to be great for the vlog. They show 10-8 offsuit. So they did have a gut shot on the flop, but yeah, they didn't get there and they did use a draw. 
as a good opportunity to bluff. But the fact that they have 10 8 offsuit as a gut, like they're going to have so many gut shots on this board. I mean, clearly they're using the opportunity to bluff very liberally. And yeah, I'm absolutely getting owned when I'm folding a hand as strong as Ace King here. And I mean, I would already be kicking myself, but I think this, this really shows that it is a bad fault by me. This next hand is very literally the next hand in the game. I'm the small blind for it. But first, the hijack opens it up to 15. Then the same villain from the previous hand calls on the button. Then I'm in small blind with my favorite hand in all of poker. I go ahead and three bet pocket aces up to 70. Then the hijack folds and the button calls. So we go heads up to a flop yet again. This time it's 10-7-4 with two clubs. The actions on me, an interesting decision whether we want to check or bet here. Aces is definitely strong enough to bet here, like of course it is, but I just like to mix it in my check range. Definitely do want to have some stronger checks, potentially induce bluffs from my opponent. I think maybe I am a bit tilted by the previous hand and I give my opponent a lot of credit for bluffing now. I mean, as I should, but, you know, maybe they just pulled off bluff. Maybe they don't want to do it twice in a row. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's a good spot to check or just go ahead and bet, but I did decide to check, and then the opponent goes ahead and bets 35. Some merit to going ahead and check raising here, try and get thin value from a 10 or a flush draw, but we do block flush draws, and I think my opponent will definitely keep barreling off with a 10, particularly after they have such a loose aggressive image. So I decide to just throw in the call. My ace is here, and we're still heads up to a turn which is the ace of diamonds, pretty sexy turn. Now, I don't think there is some merit to having a leading range on this turn. A lot of our floats on the flop are going to be ace-king, ace-queen, ace-jack, and I, I would actually like leading some of those here because I do expect my opponent to check back a hand like jack-10, queen-10 a lot here. Pocket aces is a bit different though, just because it is so, so strong, and we block my opponent having a worse ace so much. I actually do think we get... A lot of faults here. Because we lock up the board so much, I actually do decide to check my top set again. Really just trying to induce a bluff or a semi-bluff from my opponent most likely. Then they go ahead and bet 56, so pretty small bet sizing. The action's back on me, and after the last hand, I only have about 200 left in my stack now. So I definitely merit to going all in just to try and get value from a flush draw. Probably won't be able to get value from it on the river unless the opponent chooses to bluff with it, but I think ripping it all in probably just a better play to try and get value from those hands. Blocking so many of my opponent's strongest two bear hands with the pocket aces. Like we just block them so hard. There definitely is merit to just calling to continuing to trap, trying to induce the bluffs. I don't think there is merit to both plays, but I'm Ripping it all in, probably the best play. Try and get value from draws. That's what I decided to do here. I went ahead and ripped it all in for about 200. Then my opponent hits the tank for a while. They ask if I'm steamed from the previous hand. And honestly, the answer is yes. But I do have a very strong hand here. And they're in the tank for announcing that they fold. So we do scoop in this pot here. And maybe we could have got more value. But either way, I'm just happy to rake in a big pot. So I'm under the gun with ace 10 of clubs. I raise it up to 15 and then I get five different callers. So we go six ways to a flop, which is queen four deuce rainbow. There is one club out there, but when the action checks to me, definitely want to go ahead and check this hand. Really not trying to bluff five different people out of a flop. And apparently everyone feels the same way because the action does check all the way through. So we get a free turn, which is the four of clubs. Great turn, gives us an up flush draw. And then the small blind actually decides to lead out for 75. When the action's on me, I think we have a pretty clear just call here. The thought did cross my mind to potentially raises a semi bluff here, but I really don't know what hand we'd be representing if we did that. Maybe specifically pocket queens or ace four suited, but uh, if I was my opponent, I wouldn't really buy that and I would give me a lot of credit for nut flush draws. And I just think it might be a bit face up and we're gonna make more value by just calling. Maybe someone calls behind with a worse flush draw. Maybe the small blind has a worse flush draw. If that's the case, there's definitely gonna be implied odds for just calling here, which is what I do. I throw in the call and then everyone else folds. So we heads up with the small blind to a river, which is absolutely beautiful. It is the five of clubs. So we do get there with our nut flush draw. Small blind check is actually a pretty beautiful SPR of almost exactly one left. So great spot to rip it all in, trying to maximize my value when my opponent does have a worse flush. So I go ahead and rip it all in for 238. 
then the opponent's in the tank for about 30 seconds for throwing the hand in the muck. Uh, so we can't get paid off there with our nut flush draw, but we do drag in another big pot here. So we're going to go over one last hand before we wrap this thing up. The button goes ahead and raises it up to 10. Then the small blind goes ahead and three bets it to 40. Actions on my big blind with pocket jacks and I go ahead and four bet it to 100. Don't want to have a cold calling range in this dynamic. So if we're playing four bet or fold, pocket jacks is going to have to be a four bet. Folding it here would just be way, way too tight in a button, small blind, big blind dynamic. There's some opponents who only do three bet with basically queens plus an ace king, in which case folding would make sense, but we can't assume that about opponents. We do have to assume opponents have some aggression sometimes. If we've learned anything from this session, I four bet it to 100. The button folds and then the small blind throws in the call. So we're heads up to a flop of ace nine nine with two diamonds. Small blind checks it over to me and I definitely want to go ahead and C bet on this board in a four bet pot. I'm actually going to be C betting pretty much any board texture in a four bet pot just because you're going to have such a strong range when you're going to have basically a range that's just packed full of aces and kings. And on this board, you're going to have ace king as well, it's like ace five suit and stuff. So great spot to have a range bet in my opinion. I decide to make it 50 and then the actions on the opponent and they hit the tank for like probably 45 seconds a minute before they're just like staring me down. I can tell they're really considering how they want to play their hand here. And I'm not sure if we want to call her a fold. Like they definitely could have pocket tens. They could also have ace king. They could also have pocket queens, pocket kings. So they eventually decide to go all in for about 250. And with pocket jacks here, it's going to be a pretty easy fold. Like I said, my opponent can definitely have ace king. And even if they do have like queens or kings, I could see them ripping it all in. Whatever the case, I have to fold with jacks here. I have so many ace x hands in my range that are just easy call downs. So I don't need to mix it in with the jacks. And I think we can fold it when we're behind in this hand. So those were the most interesting hands I played over the session. Originally, when I finished recording it, I gave myself a gameplay grade of C+, but I'm in the middle of editing the current vlog and going over some of the hand histories. I want to give myself a different grade. I landed on a D+. I was pretty disappointed looking back at these hand histories with how I played them. I think overall, I was just kind of playing too nitty and on tilt for a lot of the hands in this, which I did allude to during the analysis. And just looking back and reflecting on the game, I think the reason I was sort of so tilted and so nitty most of the game was it's just because it was my first time playing at this game. No one did or said anything to tilt me or make me upset or uncomfortable. It's just I'm the type of person when I'm in a new place with a new group of people for the first time, it makes me feel a bit uncomfortable. And that's just to do with me being introverted, it has nothing to do with the way anyone was. Everyone was friendly and super funny and cool to be around. I just wasn't used to being in this group of people whereas you know when I'm like grinding back when I used to grind 2-5 at Crown I sort of like knew all the regulars and I was really comfy with like the seats and the layout of the room and then as things sort of started to not go my way definitely did have that tilt me as well which landed me on a pretty poor performance from this session. I've learned this lesson before the first time I went to Los Angeles I was so keen to get in and play poker there that I hopped into a 5-10 game at the Commerce and if you've ever been to the Commerce Casino, you know it's like a complete zoo in there. There's just like thousands of people, everyone's yelling, and I was super, super uncomfortable there. And I actually played awful, ended up losing 4K on my first day in LA. And from that point on, I'm like, okay, if I ever go to a new casino or a new poker room for the first time, do not shot take, do not play your biggest game, just start out at really low stakes and just get comfortable with the surroundings, with the room and then after a few hours maybe move up in stakes or wait until the second time you come back there. And I'm glad that I was playing 1-3 in this game because I definitely did play poorly but fortunately in this instance it only cost me 170 rather than $4,000 US. So after the seven hours of play, I did buy in for 500 and ended up cashing out 330 after I tipped the dealer. So a total loss of 170. Like I said, was on tilt for certain hands during this thing and it definitely contributed to why I lost in the game. I think I could have had a win if I was on my, even like my B game, I think I could have won at this game. So pretty disappointed, not only with my performance, but no one likes to lose, all right? That's gonna wrap it up for today. Thank you for sticking all the way to the end of the 
vlog. That really does help my channel's analytics. If you haven't already, hop in the comments below and needle me for being a massive nit this session. Hop in the comments and let me have it. But for now, I'm out of here. Peace.